I don't know if we realize the weight of what we're singing about this morning. It, it was believed to be about 1300 BC when the nation of Israel was enslaved during their time of being in Egypt. And God calls a man by the name of Moses to go down to lead his people out of bondage. And what he says to him when he calls him is, I have seen the affliction of my people and I have heard their cries and I have come down to deliver them. And friends, th this is the essence of what we believe in that is different from every other religious system of our world. Because every other belief system has this one common thread, that, that God is God and if you and I work hard enough, we worship good enough, we're moral enough, we can maybe get to God and be with Him for eternity. But only in Christ did God come down to you and I to deliver us. Friends, that is the hope we have in the gospel. So real quick, could we just lift our hands across the house and could you just worship God and thank Him that He is God with us. Emmanuel, God, He has come down to deliver us this morning. Come on, one second, just lift your voice to Him. Worship Him this morning for His goodness and His grace and His mercy towards us. Father, we thank You. We thank You, Lord. Amen. When we put our, our faith in this work that Christ has done on our behalf. I told our high school students just this past Wednesday, it, it is a personal relationship that we have, but it is never private. One of the initiatives the Word calls us to take to display to everyone what we have come to believe in is a step of baptism. What we're doing is we're symbolizing the work of salvation, is that just as we have died the death in the death of Christ and been raised to new life by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what we're displaying to everyone around us when we take this step. And so we actually have a couple this morning that is doing it together, Mr. Jason and Miss Carisha Bailey. Can we give it up for them? I think Miss Chris is going to be first. Come on, can we thank God for what he's doing this morning? My name is Pastor Alex. And I'm Rebecca. This is my wife and we are the new Upper Room High School Youth Pastors. We are honored to be here. We're still trying to get to know everybody, names, faces, all the things, um, but we're so excited to be here. Listen, so a few things to know about that's coming up. First thing, connection groups. We took a break around the holidays, but they are officially back on. There's tons of groups for you to get involved in and connected with. Um, so we want you to go to the website. You can check out all the groups, where they're meeting, what's happening, find one that's best for you and your family. And we would love for you to find a way to get connected, to find some people to do life with. And this year's Easter play is ca called The Passion of Christ and tryouts are beginning this week. So be looking out for dates and times to see how you can get involved. I think the Christmas play was amazing this past year, and so Easter is gonna go up a whole nother notch, so it's gonna be awesome. And lastly, starting, I believe this Sunday, Pastor is gonna begin a series of messages focused on marriages. Every week is gonna be so good, um, and it's all gonna culminate on February 11th, celebrating Valentine's Day in a special way for one of the very first times. Uh, you just see it on the sign right here, Make Marriages Great Again. Totally creative name that he just came up with all on his own. Um, but on that Sunday morning, we're going to do a special service, a special vow renewal service, and there's also some more special things coming. We're not going to reveal it yet, but we just want you to be on the lookout for things coming. It's going to be so good. So we're excited you're here. We're thankful you're at church with us now. In just a few moments, service will get started. We're excited you're here to worship with us. Bye.
We are so glad you're here. And thank you so much for everybody that prayed for us and supported us while we went to Romania and Pastor and Coleman went to Ukraine. And it was just an amazing trip. It would take me forever to share all of the great things that happened. But we just thank you, church, for being a part of that. And I want to take a minute now and worship God in our giving. In James 1, 27, it says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And I've read that scripture before. I've read it my whole life, and I thought I had a grasp of what it meant. And then when we went on this trip, you know sometimes when you read scripture again, and it's like it just comes alive. It's like all new to you all over again. And that was kind of how it happened to me this trip, because we took the, the gifts to all the children, and it's so much fun. It's such a blessing. You get to get in their environment and see their world and see life kind of from their perspective. And you can start playing those. I, I just put a ton of pictures up here. I just want you to see them as I'm talking to you this morning. But you get in that environment and you see life from their perspective. And you see that maybe they don't have everything that we've got, but they're thankful. They're just thankful for what you have for what they have. And we had a new team go with us this time, Josh and Melinda Brown, and I just, I wanted to share with you some of the exclamations that they shared during this trip that just, I don't know, it just purified my heart. It, what it says is pure and undefiled religion when you minister to these babies. And it, that's what happened to me on this trip when we were there at the feeding center and Josh Brown, he said, this is the best thing I've done all week. And we'd been doing a lot, but that was the best thing he had ever, he had done all week. And then little Josh, when we got done with our day at the orphanage and we had shared with them and we had had Tom giving out presents and he said, this is the best day ever. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, that's how God wants us to see these moments. And it doesn't matter if it's in this moment that you're giving a gift, or whether you're across the seas in Romania. This needs to be the best moment in your life because you're given to the kingdom. And that's how God purifies your, li your life and your heart. Because you're not worried about, well, how, how am I going to pay my tithes because i got bills to pay? How am I going to give to this ministry because I've got this to take care of? When you're doing God's work, you know he's your source, he's your provider, and you don't have to worry about all the rest. You work your job, you do the right things, you manage your money right, but he helps you do that. And you no longer worry about where it's coming from, you just obey him. So I challenge you today, yes, let him be your source, let him be your guide. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much. I thank you that you are such a great God. And I thank you that you are our provider. You are our source. And when we trust in you, God, we don't have to worry about where the blessings are going to come from. We just lean on you. And in the tough times, we lean on you harder. And we trust you more. And I thank you that you're that kind of God. And I thank you also that you look at us and say, join me right here in the middle of what I'm doing. And I'll make you a vessel that my blessings can not only come to, but flow through. And I thank you for every giver in this house. I thank you that they're ready to be vessels for your kingdom. And I pray you would overwhelm them this year with more blessings that they can't hold on to, that they eagerly just look for new opportunities and new places to give and pour out blessings. And I thank you for this great church. I pray you'd always help us be good stewards of everything you bring here. And I pray for every word we say, every deed we do, and every gift we bring. I pray, God, it would bring you glory and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Just ask away. If they are still at the mention of his name, they'll say, my God is still the same. Ask the walls 
If they still fall at the mighty sound of praise, they'll say, my God is still the same. When did it break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has, never will, my God is still the same. When did he lose his power? When did his mercy change? Never has, never will. My God is still the same as the grave. If it's strong enough to keep hope in its chains, it'll say. Stay in the spirit of worship. Stand with us as we continue to worship God this morning. There's a grace when the heart is undefined. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning I know that we'll never be alone there was another end of fire standing next to me there was another in the waters holding back the seas and should I ever need reminding how I've been set free there's a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There's another in the fire There's another in the fire Oh my death of a dead beneath the water Sleep. 
There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still lives and will be through it all. Amen. So come with me in the space between all the things and see and his reckoning. I know I will never be alone. This
water in the Red Sea Struck down the best of the enemy One shout and the walls came tumbling down nations bringing accusation of genocide simply because Israel is defending herself there's a miracle in this war the Palestinians are actually joining with the Hebrews because they're tired of that regime that was in charge to begin with our whole country seems to be falling apart with everybody hating on each other and the chaos of this world finding it in the hearts and minds of Bible believing Christians Folks who know better. 
But the Bible says, when you see these things start to happen, lift up your head, your redemption draws nigh. Riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Somebody give God praise today. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Remain standing with me, please, for the reading of God's Word. Aren't you glad to be in God's house? What a wonderful, wonderful season of worship. Thank you, praise team. Genesis chapter 24. I'm going to start our discussion on make marriage great again. I don't know what inspired me. I do appreciate our new student ministries pastor. I notice he's having trouble remembering what his title is because we don't really talk about titles much around here. He was the upper room student ministry youth pastor extraordinaire in that video. (laughs) But he did give me a shout out on my uh, creativity for my wonderful moment of insight. I think we need to make marriage great again. I think we've been messing it up so long we need a miracle. I want to preach to two kinds of folks today, those that are married and those that want to get married. And I want to talk to those of you who've given up, that just maybe God will give you a heart that will love like you've never been hurt. But I believe we need a cornerstone of God's grace on marriages. Hell has assaulted the home, trying to wreck our marriages by redefining gender identity and gender roles teaching rebellion to the hearts and minds of children, enslaving them to the pornography of our internet systems. And before long, the whole thing unravels. But here at the Buford Church of God, we're throwing up a lifeline and we're going to say no more after today. We're going to let God's glory be revealed in our homes. We want revival at at our house. I believe God can do that. Genesis chapter 24, we're going to read verses 63 through 67. As you're turning there, I want to make this every week I'm going to do this I'm going to recommend a book I don't normally do this but I believe these are are good books that will help your relationships and if you're looking for a a, a relationship it will help you find the right one and our first recommendation my wife and I've talked about this is a book by Gary Chapman entitled The Five Love Languages I don't know if you've had an opportunity to read this book or hear about it but it is a godsend There are five love languages, quality time, words of affirmation, gifts, acts of service, physical touch. And not everybody communicates love the same way and not everybody hears love the same way. And I think if you know how your partner hears love, you can supply that. And in turn, if your spouse knows how you hear love, they will be able to serve in that capacity as well. You need to know what those things are. And communicate with each other. Now, fellas, I I, I know this book is purple, which means you're probably not going to read it. (laughs) And so I am asking that at least get it in the house and let her follow you around the house like my wife does with me. I have read so many books in my life because she read them to me. You in the same boat, Manny, right? And so I I would like this to be a reference in your home. Would you take the word of God, hold the scriptures close to your heart? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. I pray that I would pay attention. Don't let me spend any time today trying to figure out who it belongs to. God, I didn't show up to watch somebody else get blessed. I didn't arrive today to watch somebody else praise you. I came to praise you for myself. I came to slide my feet under the master's table and hear heaven call, come and dine, come and dine. Let your glory be revealed in me today. In Jesus' name. Please remain standing. Genesis chapter 24, starting with verse 63. A long chapter. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. 
And he lifted up his eyes and looked. And there were the camels carrying Rebecca. They were coming. Then Rebecca lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. And she said, who is this man? Yeah. That's what my wife said when I first met her. Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, it is my master. So she took a veil, covered herself, and the servant testified, told Isaac all the things that he had done, what God had done. So Isaac brought her home to mother's, his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Say amen at the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Best romance story in the Bible is Isaac and Rebekah. None compare. Matter of fact, if you search scripture, there's not a lot of great marriages in it. There's a lot of marriages in the Bible that put the funk in dysfunctional. Should give hope to a lot of you. The Lord has a plan and he wants you to find yourself in these stories. Matter of fact, if you look through scripture, I can't find but maybe five to six great marriages that inspire me. John the Baptist, his mom and daddy, they very inspirational. I may talk about them. Aquila and Priscilla. Adam and Eve, Joseph and Mary, Boaz and Ruth. Great love stories. I'm going to talk about a few of these over the next few weeks. And don't worry. If you're not married, it's not going to be about that. It's going to be about all of God's children seeing the symbolism of marriage the way God intended it to be seen. And for those of you who are looking, I want to help you get the right kind of eyes to find the right person. And then I also want to talk to those of you who have given up. Those who say, you know what, I am, there's no way I'm getting another man or another woman in my life. I'm not going to try and talk you into it, but I do want you to help me pray for these marriages that are here. Because if we have a miracle in marriage, I believe we release several things in our church. I believe we can release agreement. We can release authority. And we can release spiritual ammunition. The Bible says if any two will agree is touching anything, you can ask what you will and it shall be done. When my wife and I lay our hands on you, it's the most powerful form of agreement I can share with your life. She and I agree. If this church doesn't survive, we may not be able to survive. It's not that we won't survive as an individual, but our ministry, our hopes, our futures, our dreams. We're in it together. We agree with each other. We're looking in the same direction. We're fighting the same devils. And when we lay our hands on you, if any two will agree is touching anything, that's you. We can ask what we will and it shall be done. There's a blessing when you're blessed times two, when you have two that lay their hands on you in agreement. There's also authority. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm right there in the middle of them. And whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I believe that many times we fail to recognize that there's authority in unity. I want that authority restored in our church, in our hearts, our homes, our community. Last but not least is spiritual ammunition. Paul said, I didn't say it, Paul said, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, laid himself down for it. And children, shut up. <laughs> and children, obey your parents so that your days may be long on the earth. Basically, behave or your mama will kill you. <laughs> We have a tough time with that verse because the women have to submit. We're trying to figure out what that means. Why do women get that commandment and the men just have to love? Because you see it in the wrong light. That phrase was rehearsed on our Wednesday night service with Pastor Raymond Hardy. And I've never read it the way he did. 
He said that's written in the military handbook, the book of Ephesians. And in that book, God describes authority in the home not so that you can understand who should say yes and who should say no. He described authority in the home because he's trying to turn you into a military unit. He wants you to become a weapon of mass destruction in hell. Let me tell you what this looks like. Years ago, someone vaguely or distantly connected to our church made threats against me and and my family. And we believed them. It's a long time past. There's no reason to worry about it anymore. But it was troubling at the time that they would say so many crazy things about us. Well, one day that individual was at my house acting crazy. Do you guys hear music? It's worship music? Where's it coming from? Is it kids' church? Speak out loud. It's in the sound system. We have worship music in the sound system. <laughs> Praise God. It's the angels in heaven. <laughs> But I looked out in my front yard and that individual was there and and I didn't know what they were about. Matter of fact, I didn't even recognize them. They were half dressed and it was weird. And I was going out my front door with my pistol. Um, And when I saw this individual, they ended up leaving. We had no problems. And when I came back in, Mia was behind me with a loaded nine. (laughs) Josiah's at the top of the stairs with a sword. What Paul was saying is, when danger comes to your house, Daddy, you go first. If anybody dies at my house, it's going to be me. You don't get to my family unless it's over my... You're not going to come in my house that way. I gave myself for my family. I stood in front of them. Sweetie, don't worry about it. You, you, don't, you don't stand out front. On this day, Daddy's going to take... The shield. He's going to take the sword. But just behind me, my wife is submissive to me. And she's ready to back me up and help me in times of combat. And there's my children, quiver full of them, ready to rock and roll. My boys in the background going, just save a little bit for all of us. The reason that you have a difficulty with submission in your house is you don't have a ministry. You don't have an enemy and you don't have a purpose. And so your life gets lost in the boring list of who gets to be in charge. But if you ever start to fight the devil, that verse makes a whole lot more sense. Anyway, I want to release this into your life. So let's talk about Isaac and Rebecca. We'll wrap this up and I'm going to pray for you. And ask God to release these things in your life. I would almost, uh, there goes Pastor Todd. He's going to track it down. This is like an Easter egg hunt. Oh, that's it. Yeah, give it up for Pastor Todd. All right. You don't understand how hard it is to live in in this world right here. And there are times that I genuinely worry that I'm losing it. There are five great moments in the life of Isaac and Rebecca. I won't talk long about them. I don't have the time. But the number one miracle that happened, the first thing that happened is their parents fought to protect the sanctity of their affections. When Isaac was a child, his daddy took one of the workers in his company and he said, 
You go to God's people and find a suitable spouse for my son. Don't get my baby's spouse from the bar. I don't want them from the concert or the party. I want them in the house of God. Listen to me. What you value is where your kids will search. And I'm afraid that far too often we don't build the right priorities in our home so our children don't look for people that fit what we say we serve. Nobody in this house loves a football game more than me. Especially now that Nick Saban has retired. I love that man. I I, I admire him and respect him, but I thank God we don't have to play against him anymore. (laughs) But I love watching football. I love to see a good sports game. But listen to me. My children know that if you want daddy's attention, it won't be because you get a trophy. It won't be the only place you get to see me excited. Too many times, the only time that the children see daddy cranked up is when they're watching their sports game. But my children know if you want to see me excited, come to the altar. Find me in a worship experience glorifying and magnifying God. That's the place where our priorities are built. Find me a child that's raised in a home that values the manifest presence of God and I'll show you a house that's built on a rock and not on the sinking sand of academic achievement, athletic success, monetary gain. Now listen, my children are going to college. They make great grades. Both of my sons have pursued athletic interest and extracurricular activities. And we show up and we're excited for them. And we bless them in those moments. I want my sons to make a lot of money. I started teaching them some words when they were young. Home health care nurse. Say it with me. (laughs) See, I don't have any girls, which means I run a great risk of going straight to the nursing home quick. (laughs) I want my children to succeed. But let them praise God. That's what drives me. I I don't want to see them bring somebody home who doesn't glorify God's name and me somehow be happy because she has money or helps them succeed academically. No. I would rather see them build their house on the rock of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that will last. Second great thing that happened in their story was they hired a great youth pastor who was led by the Spirit. The Bible says they hired someone out of the house to go to this land. And while that individual was going who wasn't related, they were just an influencer in the home, that person started praying, Oh God, give me wisdom. Let me find the right one. Give me a sign, Heavenly Father. And God said, Let the woman who waters the camels. Don't let her just get you water. Let the one that waters you and the camels. Let that one be the one you choose. You need godly youth workers and godly influencers who help you pray for your child. If you're ever the most important person in your child's life, you're going to lose that battle because your cool points will eventually disappear. You need other people. Matter of fact, if you're in this house today and you volunteer or you are paid to work with our children in any way in our nursery, our children's program, or our youth program, college and career, would you please stand in this house right now? I want you to put your hands together and thank God for every person that's praying for our children. Praise the Lord. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They put a godly person in their life. And they helped them find the right person to be with. I want your children to be able to find a spouse right here in the church. We have the most beautiful girls in the history of earth that attend our church. We have some of the strongest, most godly young men you'll ever encounter in your life. They love God and they fear God. I have an unusual gift. I remember my first thought when I meet people. And many of you have come up to me and said to me from time to time, well, what was your first thought when you met me? Because you're worried. <laughs> the good news is I'm not a hater. I don't meet people and start thinking negative. It, it doesn't happen. Unless someone's just super demon-possessed, I see potential and possibility. I don't see problems. So don't worry about that. It, it's not like that. Kelly Frady was one of the first individuals to hear me say that in a funeral. To come to me and say, all right, go ahead. What did you think when you first met me? I said, it wasn't when I came to be pastor. She said, what are you talking about? I said, the first time I noticed you was when Vonnie was singing. And I watched you watch him. Because you were in love. And my second thought when I met you was, look what the Lord has done. A couple that met each other in the youth group and built an extraordinary family because Isaac and Rebecca found water at the well in the house of God. That's what I want for this place. I want to make marriage great again. I, I want it to be a built on the altar and not on something out there. I want it to be built on the Spirit of God. I believe we can do this. Brick by brick, stone by stone, we can lay a foundation for a great church. The next great miracle in their life was Rebecca watered the camels. Find you a woman, find you a man that will go the extra mile. They're hard to come by. You need to see how they talk to their mama, how they talk to their daddy. What's their work ethic? You need to make sure that you pick the right person because you see them when nobody else is watching do things that are godly and holy. Early on in my relationship with Mia, when we were just getting to know each other, we were riding down the road. She had a red cutlass. And we were riding down the road and someone pulled out in front of that car. And she had to slam on her brakes. And when she slammed on her brakes, that car jolted. She reached her hand over in front of me. I looked down at that hand that was trying to protect me from hurting myself. And I thought, I got to put a ring on that finger right there. I've got, my Lord. Find somebody that goes the extra mile. Let me tell you something. Pastor. What's watering the camels? Here it is. It's worship. It's worship. You me tell you how to pick your spouse? See how beautiful they are while they're worshiping. Man, I'm going to tell you what. When I was in Lee and, and we first got there and they had all those worship services and all them girls from all over the Church of God world were there and they were all worshiping. Then I saw Mia, and I watched how she praised the Lord. I watched how she worshiped. I watched how she magnified God. If they can't worship, don't marry them. Don't marry somebody who can't praise the Lord. They're not going to magically start because you're in their life. You better let God get finished with them before you start getting involved with them because you'll distract them from their relationship with God and not help. Somebody help me talk about it. You better watch it when their hands go up. They move them little fingers, and that's, that's how you glorify God. Don't find them at the bar. Don't go to some party. Don't hang out with somebody and stay drunk long enough to get somebody and then drag them to church and hope everything changes. 
And I know that some of you, that's exactly what you did and you're still here. Thank God you repented. But please, don't let me convince them to do it your way. You're a miracle. It took a miracle to rescue your family after all those bad choices. But thanks be unto God, we got a shot here at preserving the next generation from having to follow in your footsteps. Can I get a witness from somebody? I want them to be better than us. I want them to aim higher than us. I want them to walk closer to God than we do. They can do it if we cut them loose to be that, that God's called them to be. Find somebody who worships. Find somebody who waters the camel. I, I need to hurry. Let me, let me get to this. This is my favorite. Love at first sight. Who is this man? Oh, that's, that's one of my most favorite verses in the whole Bible right there. Matter of fact, Mia, we're going to read that together today. We're... <laughs> Matter of fact, I want you all to hear how she reads this. <laughs> See right there where it says, she dismounted, and then Rebecca lifted her eyes. Just read that part to him. To... <laughs> then Rebecca lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. For she said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? Exactly right. God bless you. I love you. <laughs> love at first sight. But I want you to see how this happened. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. Where did he find his promise? He didn't. It found him. You see, your problem is you think you got to chase it. But if you'll go out into the fields of God's authority and be meditating on God's word, God will bring to you those things you've been praying for. You've been fighting and clawing trying to get your way. But if you'll seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things will be added unto you. You just hang out where God told you to be. And eventually riding on the backs of praise. <laughs> that bride will arrive. And God will bring that promise into your life. And the Bible says that when he looked at her, immediately that, that worker started testifying. Hey, look what the Lord has done. I can see what God has done. He has healed my body, touched my mind. He started testifying about the goodness of God. The great things of the Lord. You need to know their testimony. How they got to you. What's the story? Told the testimony. And when he heard the testimony, heard that it was the Lord, immediately. Somebody say immediately. Immediately, immediately took her home, married that woman. That day. Thank you, Jesus. Suddenly miracles. Now, I'm not advising anybody to get married this afternoon. Had a young man come to me years ago, and he had a girl that he was dating. And uh, I had feelings about this relationship, but I didn't tell anybody. But he came to me, and he said, I want to talk to you about this relationship that I'm in. I need to get your advice. I said, well, take your time. Go slow. Quit worrying about making long distance commitments and just enjoy coffee this could take years to be what it's supposed to be just slow down take it easy I think that's good advice well a few months later they broke up and then several months after that he brought a new girl to me and I met her she came down to the altars He came to me after some period of time dating this little girl and he said, I know what you're going to say. I know your advice. But I want to go ahead and submit myself to your authority and ask you what you think about this girl that I've been dating. I said, do you remember what I told you the last time? He goes, yes, sir, I do. I said, forget all of it. 
He said, what are you talking about? I said, hurry. <laughs> I said, if it even looks like she's ready to say yes, get her to the church and we'll marry her that day. Don't you mess this up. And I'm proud to report that Ryan Brackett is now at... He and his beautiful bride are the youth pastors, staff pastors at Scott Crow's church. They now have a miracle baby. I encourage you to go home and look what the Lord has done in their life. You don't have to chase your dreams. You don't have to fight and claw. You don't have to manipulate. Sometimes you just have to wait on God. But my most important prayer, my most important miracle, the Greatest moment in the life of Isaac and Rebecca for me is when she couldn't have babies. She was barren. Now everybody else in the Old Testament, almost without exception, flunked this test. Abraham just took the handmaiden of Sarah. Elkanah, the husband of Hannah, he just started whining about her mood swings. All throughout the scripture you see multiple wives and different people making crazy decisions just so they can have children. Not Isaac. The Bible says in Genesis 25 verse 21, Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife. Laid hands on her. Asked God to heal her. And the Lord granted his prayer. They loved each other. I don't know if you're married. I don't know if you're looking for marriage. I don't know if you've given up. But these stories in the Bible are real. And I thank God for Chad Smith last week. That sermon, I watched it all the way from Romania. One of the greatest sermons I've ever heard in my life. He preached the word of God. But what I love about Chad is how bold he is to tell his testimony. See, I was a friend to Chad then. I knew him when everything fell apart. I know his whole family. He used to call sometimes his mother's house and I would be over there eating at his mother's house. And he would say, listen, you can have my church, you can have my office, you can have my youth ministry, but you can't have my mama. <laughs> she was an amazing cook. <laughs> Even Siri agrees with me today. What is going on with the children's family and technology today? <laughs> but I remember, <laughs> right here, folks, right? <laughs> Bring it on. But I, I remember when, when everything fell apart. I remember when he fought hard to get Danette back. I preached for him not too long ago at his church. Love Chad. Love his family. Love his ministry. And I'm glad he told you the story. Because some of you here today, you don't have the love at first sight stuff. You don't have the cool little miracles. You don't have anybody that prayed for you. You made all the wrong decisions. The good news is, last week you heard a testimony. That there's never a time in your life where it's too late to start doing the right thing. And that if you'll seek first the kingdom of God, he'll provide things in your life God will heal and provide and reconcile and make a way where there's been no way but I want the homes in this house healed I want authority released I want agreement to come together as one and I want spiritual ammunition to take out the powers of hell the Sunday before Valentine's Day we're going to have a renewal of vows and if you're here and you're not married, I'm going to have a special commitment on your part that I want you to repeat as well. We're going to call you to purity and prayer. 
We're going to call our marriages back to the foundation on which they were built. And I'm going to ask God to turn you into lighthouses on a hillside. Mia, if you'll join me on stage, please, with those red boots. <laughs> Hello, darling. <laughs> quite all right my wife and I we're in love I love her more now than I did when I married her and I know everybody says that and I think you're supposed to say that but all I can tell you is it's the truth I I don't know how to explain it but it's it's radically different I think I know more about myself and I know more about her and and the more you get to know them underneath the light of God's glory it just gets better And if you're sideways and you're not where you want to be, I believe God can lead you here because my wife and I are not perfect. Never have been. I don't want to go down a list of reasons that you could write me off as being a spiritual leader in your life. All I can tell you is I'm in all points tempted like as you are. So is she. But God brought us together and we're in agreement. We work hard to be in agreement. So Mia, if you'll stretch your hands over them. Josiah, if you'll join me on stage. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, God, right now, please make marriages great again. Both for those who are married and for those who want to get married and for those who've given up. I just ask you, Heavenly Father, that we would see it in the proper light. That we wouldn't start to celebrate people because of their individuality and their ability to do things on their own but we would start to celebrate agreement and authority and the spiritual ammunition that declares war on the kingdom of darkness my wife and I in total agreement put our hands on this church right now and I ask you God let your kingdom come and I pray God you would heal their bodies get the cancer out of their life I pray God you would heal their headaches I pray their back pains would disappear I pray their wayward children would make a phone call and come home to their faith heavenly father let your glory be reconciled in their finances I pray for new vision and new hopes and new tomorrows let your kingdom come and let your will be done let your power be revealed before I bless your life I want you to stand with me all over the house and I want you to hear our heart as my wife and I we lift our hands over this congregation and I want this song to become the reality of your life Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you 
is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. Praise God. I, I, I feel the Holy Spirit. Can we do that bridge one more time? I, I, I feel a release of the anointing in this house. I feel sickness leaving somebody's body. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know who you are or what you brought with you. But there's faith in the house. There's a glorious countenance over this place. I asked God this week. It's a dangerous prayer and I don't know what he meant. I'm trying to figure it out. But I was reading in the scriptures where Paul was preaching and he saw a man that was lame and had not been able to walk from birth. And the Bible says when he saw that he had faith to be healed. And I asked God, I said, God, give me that kind of eyesight. How do you see faith? like that I don't know what you're talking about how can I see it in somebody else when they have faith and God said it's not a matter of me giving you eyes that can see it's a matter of me receiving from you the seeing eyes that you have he said you can't see faith until it's all that you see All I can tell you is there's a miracle going on right now in my eyesight. As I'm looking around the congregation, I see faith. I ask God for it and I can sense it. I can see it. And I believe that there's several in this house right now. God's doing a miracle in your life right now. And I don't know what you've been praying for, but I feel virtue flowing in the house. And I want us to receive this right now. Flow in this place, Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you.
the altars here in just a moment for everybody. I, it's already open. You can come anytime you'd like. I do want to lead you in the sinner's prayer. We have a lot of people watching us. There are folks here today who may not know the Lord. And there's no greater miracle in your life than to give your heart to Jesus Christ. When I get finished with this prayer, I'm going to bless the house. I'll dismiss the service and then we're going to start church all over again. And I want as many of you that will to let my wife and I lay our hands on you in a prayer of agreement and let God move in your life. I know God can do this. Before I do that, I want to say to those of you watching me by television or online or in the house, you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to live in hell. We have found blood that pardons and we have found stripes that heal. I want to teach you a prayer as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. I can teach you a prayer and I believe it will make a difference. I want you to say this with me. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I'm so sorry. I'm coming home. I know you came. I know you lived and died for me. I know you rose from the dead. And I know you're coming back. I don't want to be left out. So please, come into my heart. Save my soul. Write my name down in your book. Help me be a Christian. In Jesus' name. Contact the church with the number that's on your screen. Type into the chat stream. I prayed that prayer. If you prayed it in the sanctuary, come to the altar. Say it when I pray for you. I prayed that prayer. We want to help you. Now let me bless you and we'll open these altars. May you be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed when you rise and when you lay down at night. May the Lord bless you and keep you and turn his countenance towards you and be gracious to you. Make his face shine on you and give you peace. Beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. A garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm on your face and the rains fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again. May God hold you in the hollow of his hand. God bless you. I love you. I'll see you next Sunday.